It's Ebro in the morning. We got something special today. Laura Styles and Rosenberg are here. Yeah. And, um, that is special. Uh, no, that's not special. The You're woman special. sitting next to you, to your left, is special. Her name is Lacey Schwartz. You, you go, who is that and why is she special? No, no, I go, G. Off the top. When I hear Schwartz and I see her curly hair. <laughs> but she's also half black. Yes. Which is why she's here, because uh, she has a film that she put together and been working on how long now, Lacey? I worked in the film for eight years. Jesus wow. Lord. And, well, I mean, let's get right to it. It's a story called Little White Lie. Yes. And uh, it, uh, it's about you. Yes. It's a, do- it's a documentary. I mean, it's a straight documentary. Straight documentary, yeah. I directed and produced it, but it follows me. And what made you put this together? You know, so the film is about how I grew up in a white Jewish family and found out at the age of 18 that I was black. Mm. And so... My dream. W- my dream come true. <laughs> Talk about it. <laughs> and so, you know, how that all goes down, which we'll talk about, is covered in the film. But for me, you know, I started doing this film in my 20s when I was living what I considered to be a racial closet. I was identifying as black out in the world, but I hadn't talked to my family about being white and Jewish. Okay, let's stop right there. Um, How did that take place in your world? Because I want to get... Which part? Wanna, well, how did it take place that you're identifying yourself as black and then yeah. at home... You're not having this conversation. Why? Well, because I grew up with two white Jewish parents who were my parents through and through the whole time. And so nobody talked about, you know, really me being different in any way. And so not until I went away to college and then I came home for my freshman year did I ask my mother the truth. So were you adopted? No, my biological father was black. My mother had an affair. And no one talked about it. Oh. Now, Amazing. I have a lot of things to get, a lot of questions. Well, about. itemize them so we can get through them. Okay, well, first of all, did you figure out you were black because you started laughing really hard at Tyler Perry movies? <laughs> <laughs> no, what was it? What made you start besides your features and stuff? Because and you, you have full lips. You know, if you were to walk up to me on the street, I would be like, you're mixed. You're mixed with something. Right. I mean, that was the main thing. So first of all, I grew up in a town, Woodstock, New York, which is really kind of like this white liberal bubble where people didn't talk about race. You know, so I was able to grow up in this space where... And it's you not know, like you were hearing lots of racist stuff. And I sorry. would no, right. you know, it wasn't racist. It just was lack of race, Got like it. no race consciousness, right? Nobody was talking about race, and so because of that, my kind of difference, the way I look, was explained away by uh, saying that we had, I had a great grandfather who was Sicilian. That Dark. is so oh, classic, by the way. Out, time out. So they, wait, your no family way. lied. They were lying. See you the know, name of the movie. Yes, but that, I mean, I thought maybe, you know, little, because it's little white lie, which most of the time we think of as like, eh, it's a lightweight mistruth. No, this is a bold face Well, this is the lie. way I look at it. Like, I look at it, like, was their lying going down at various points? Yes, but more so than lying, it's really about denial. So I actually think that my family convinced themselves as well that that was the truth. That's nice of you. Do you have siblings? Yeah. I don't. I'm an only, well. I'm an only child by my parents. Okay. Yeah. So no, I really think. I mean, and that's really what the, part of what the film covers is looking at everybody's denial and how something like that can happen. How people can convince themselves. Did you in the movie? Do you interview your parents about all these things? I do. So I mean, I had only talked to my mother about it when I was 18, and then never talked to anybody else about it. So in the movie, I don't talk to my father until I'm past 30 or anybody else in my family. Like I literally wow. lived after I knew I didn't talk to anybody in my family for 12 years about it. Wow. About it. Okay. You you were still good with it. Oh, no, I was still totally good with you them. You just I kept just, it to yourself yeah. pretty much? Wow. Yeah. So how, how yeah, why, why did you do that? Hold why on, Laura. Why? Okay, why keep it to yourself? You know, I think it was a process for me of being afraid of not necessarily just being rejected, but of hurting people and disturbing, you know, kind of this family that I had come from. Even though my parents were divorced, I was still really afraid of losing my relationship with my father by saying that I wasn't his child. You know, so it was the race piece, but the race piece was completely caught up in the paternity piece. We're going to go to no, you next, Laura. Okay. One second. Did your father <laughs> know about the affair? My father knew that my mother had had an affair at various points. He did not know that when she got pregnant, it was not his. Now, did your mom hope against hope that it was his? Yes, and I think at a certain point, she even convinced herself that it was his. I was his, I should say. So you got so they never had a moment of truth. This could possibly not be your kid. They never talked about that. They talked about it when they split up when I was sixteen and it wasn't really a full conversation. It was just like my dad was like, I know the truth. Wow. Oh, but and, they, they did eventually split up. Yeah, when I was sixteen. Mm-hmm. 
How did your mom feel about you making this documentary? Because that you're really putting all her business out there. Yeah, my mom. I think at first she was scared. Mm -hmm. You know, she was scared after kind of trying to maintain and, and and keep the secrets for so long. But in the end, I think she realized that it was kind of what she had to do to to maintain our relationship and keep it going strong. And now that it's out. She really loves it. Like she feels like it taught her how to stop lying because that was something that she had a really hard time so stopping there is, doing. So there is some. Oh yeah, the film is dealing with lying and not just because denial is a nice way to. Put oh no, no. Listen, my mother was only in denial for like two years, okay. and then it turned to lying. So you said <laughs> uh, just a second ago, um, you live in Woodstock. It's a that racism isn't, isn't the issue. Racism is not the issue. It's right. A, it's kind of like there is no recognition of race, which can cause its own problems. Absolutely. Um, because you're not recognizing culture, blah 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 blah. Um, even though it's, you, even though it's a liberal, obviously it's known as a super hippie yeah, liberal yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. It's Woodstock. You know, it has that history is real. Yeah. Um, but you did say that you were afraid to talk to your father about it, your stepfather, um, yeah, because you were afraid I, that I the my father. Yeah, you were afraid that you the race issue would cause him some sort of turmoil. Right. What made you think that the... the it wasn't the was race it, issue, it was the paternity the issue. The paternity the issue. The paternity issue. And the whole thing Got is it. like, I feel like what this film is about, and my experience is about, is about my identity. My identity issues were completely connected to my race. Mm. I mean, excuse me, to the family secrets. So the fact that the identity issues are connected to the family secrets, like how do I take those things out? How can I be who I am? How can I identify fully as biracial black and still not kind of throw turmoil into my family by outing these family secrets? And only and only based on the paternity aspect, not the race aspect. Because you feel like they would, would, no matter what your background is, your family would have embraced you. You know, I, I yeah, I felt like that. I felt like that. But that being said, you know, when you're different within a family, even if you feel like they're not going to reject you based on that difference, if nobody's talking about that difference, it's nonetheless difficult, and it can feel awkward. It's not. Of I, I existed in a world where I didn't really. Um, my mother's father. I didn't. My mother's mother had passed when she was young. My mother's father didn't acknowledge me at all, um, and even to this day, my mother likes to debate it as if he didn't acknowledge me. Um, for some other reason other than race, mm -hmm. when it was really race, like it was straight up the fact that she had a son who was half black. Yeah. Um, some of her step siblings were cordial, but it wasn't like a full embrace. So I got embraced mostly by my father's side of the family. Mm -hmm. That's what I was raised. That was the culture I was around, which obviously plays itself out now um, in some ways because I consider myself black. Yes, yeah, I'm mixed race, but I consider myself black. There are mixed race individuals though who consider themselves mixed other. Whatever, blah blah blah. Yeah. But I did just hear you say that you consider yourself black. I do. I consider myself black. I look. I mean, I consider myself biracial. But I look at for me. I'm not trying to define it for other people because, as you just said, other people feel differently. But I look at being biracial as a category of being black. And why is that? You know, I think it really comes down to kind of feeling like a person of color, like other. You know, and this idea that whiteness so much is not really embraced or fully identified in this country. You know, it's looked at almost as a neutral, and I don't feel neutral. You know, so do I think that there's elements elements of me that is connected to the fact that I grew up white, and I do think I have a unique experience that mm -hmm. I grew up white, and I do know what it is to be black, and, and you I identify mean, as when black. When you say I grew up white. You're meaning in an environment that was... It named me as white, and I believed I was white. Right. I mean, it was like, it was beyond just that your family was white. You were as, that's what your identity... Right, but the, but the, reason, I keep, the reason I keep going back to it is because you describe Woodstock as a place where race was not an issue, but they categorized you as white. So that means that there was an effort to not be black. Like, my mom will say, I'm Jewish, we're not exactly white. That's your mom reaching, because like me, she wants to be black. Evidence when she <laughs> boned your dad. Hey, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can, did you ever meet, what's your relationship like with your the man who had sex with your mom? Your biological father. Yeah. Right. That's a better, more appropriate way to put it. <laughs> so, I mean, that is definitely super covered in the film, and who he was. He was kind of his own New York character. His name was Rodney Parker. Turn on the music. This, I made this up. When you met him the first time, was it like this? Oh, no, that's the wrong thing. Sorry. Damn it, I had this big moment all set up. Hold well, on, wait for it. let me tell you something. Sidebar, this is outside of this program. Oh, come on. interview with this motherfucker over here keeps fucking up on his buttons. He's about to get <sighs> treated different. A different kind of, a different kind of like, hate? And when you're going to be so mad at me in particular when you hear it because of how well, good the idea was. On. So, um, but, you know. No, my, but can we ask, can you get the question, the answer, though? I, meeting, meeting the dad? Okay, go ahead. Meeting the biological father? 
So anyway, he was kind of a, a New York character personality. His name's Rodney Parker. There's a book Rodney that was Parker. written about him called Heaven is a Playground. And it was kind of a classic street basketball book about Foster Park in Brooklyn, which is where I'm they, my mother and he met. Uh, Why was your mother hanging out at the basketball? She <laughs> was the. <laughs> that's a great question. She was the uh, park director. She ran the nursery school oh, in the it. park, in uh, in Foster Park. And so Ryan, young Rodney put that thing on that I, thing with the other thing, and then that's blah! pretty much what happened. I mean, that's how it goes down. So but, did your but, biological father? Did he knew you existed? He knew I existed, and I knew he existed. I mean, he was like kind of a family friend. "Quote unquote," oh my that I didn't man. know was my biological father. And he was around. He was a ticket scalper. Oh, so we had. Music, a... please. You all know why that for this music. <laughs> was this what it was like when you met him the first time? You can't hear it, can you? It's super fly. Yeah, okay, you got the vibes. Yeah. yeah. And I then when it. you said his name was Rodney Parker, <laughs> story's good. What's going on? Got them tickets. <laughs> Yo, you trying to see that game tonight, little girl? Oh shit, that's my daughter. So we would come down and, you know, we would go to a lot of shows, even with my dad. You know, Mm -hmm. we'd go to games and, and, you know, we lived like two hours outside of the city. And so I would see him when we came down to the city, which was fairly, you know, often. I'm so confused now. (laughs) But so what was their relation? So they were fam. They were family friends. And then they were uh, doing it on the side while your dad didn't know. I mean, I don't think they were always were, but obviously it happened at least once, you know, and, oh and a, a few God. times. So it was kind of like this, I would guess probably an on and off again relationship. But I, so I knew him. So when I found out he was my biological father, it was like, I already knew who he was. I already had a kind of a rapport with him. And so that was a complicated relationship and it, and it's, it, it's dealt with in the film. Wow. So you and your mother and your father would go to see your biological father play basketball. No, no, no. We get tickets from him oh, to okay, go to okay, games. Okay, okay, okay. Right, right, right. <laughs> wow. But without you knowing that, that's wow. I'm very excited. By the way, where can people see this movie right now? So it's playing right now at the AMC Empire up on 42nd Street between 7th and 8th. We uh, started showing there on Friday, and we're going to be showing at least through December 4th. Is it only playing in New York? It's not. We're opening in L.A. this Friday, and mm-hmm. then on December 5th, we're moving to San Francisco and D.C. Dope. I'm happy Dope. for you, man. Congratulations. Thank you. And so now, what's the, talk about the attention you're getting. I mean, New York Times gave you something amazing, right? Yeah, they just gave us a, uh, reviewed us and gave us a cr- critic's pick, which is, you know, an amazing, amazing thing to earn, and to earn their respect means a lot in the documentary film world. You know, I mean, this story obviously is can be sensational in a sense, but it really is about this larger story about family secrets, denial, and dual identity that I think connects to so many people. And cheating and adultery. Yeah, and people connect to it. Interracial sex and Yo. Brooklyn and what? No, nothing. I mean, these are all just making things. And being yes, Jewish. Being yeah. Jewish and black and a black man and, and a white Brooklyn. woman. And Why do you keep going back to that side? every time? Like You have a real thing about that part. I don't you, have oh. a thing about it. I think socially people have a thing about it. Right. I think that people do have a thing about black it. men are sexualized and sometimes respond this way and People are curious, and it results in beautiful women like this. Absolutely. You know, and, and so it is about my story, but I really think it connects into other people's stories in so many different ways. And, you know, we're asking other people to go online to submit their Little White Lies. You can do that at littlewhitelithefilm.com. So we're building a larger conversation about and this. And for those of you tuning in, you scumbags that listen to Ebro in the morning, and check us out on YouTube. You're looking at Lacey, and this young lady, Lacey Schwartz, and you're like, who is the hot, light-skinned girl with the amazing <laughs> hair? She's a mother, and she's married, so calm the fuck down. <laughs> Just Thanks. had to put that out there. But they're, <laughs> they're allowed to think that it doesn't matter whether they think that at home or not. I mean, they're not going to. I just want them to calm down. Okay. That's so don't you have any thoughts because yeah, she's a married she's woman. She's a married mother. And you have twins. I do. I do. 50 month old twins. Oh, and, wow. But what, what, what sex? They're boys. Two boys. Yeah. Huh? Identical. Mm-hmm. That's dope. So let me ask you in your, in your relationship with your husband and your kids and your family, I mean, obviously, this is open conversation now. Yeah. You guys talk about it. Does this. Does. Your mother and father, your uh, stepfather, uh-huh. and even your biological father, does this manifest itself in any of your interpersonal relationships in some way? Like, just all of this? You know, not really. I mean, again, one of the reasons I dealt, dove into this project and dealt with it is because I think things like this and secrets can have such a traumatic effect on people's lives, and it was having a traumatic effect on my life, and I needed to move past it to move forward in a healthy way. So the film is really about like kind of modeling that process, and and dealing with it in a healthy way. It's not just about exposing the drama right, right, right. and the chaos. It's it's about how do you figure out how to deal with this because lots of people have these issues. I'm sure a lot of people listening have you know found out their dad wasn't their dad or all sorts of kind of drama that goes down and how does that not have complete power over your life forever. So going through this process, I think it's brought us to a healthier place and we all have really strong, great relationships. I was afraid of losing the, 
you know, the relationships with my family, and I didn't lose any. And I think, if anything, we're just stronger than we ever were before. The fact, the whole Sicilian thing is ringing in my Hilarious. head, right? The whole fact, oh, no, you got, we got Sicilian in Especially our family. Especially even being Jewish and trying to pull that so card. Crazy. I guess there is actually real. Is there actually Sicilian? There is a real Sicilian great grandfather. Grandma. Who I mean, there's a photo. Yeah, it's like the it. most classic. Reach. And even to your point, where you're like, my mom, you know, Jews don't say, oh, where my mom goes, oh, we're not exactly white. Well. It wasn't because they were white that Hitler had a problem with it. It was because of the heritage that there was a problem. That right. He was yeah. trying to create a perfect Aryan nation that was blonde hair and blue eyes. Well, and Jewish blood is has indigenous blood in it. And you will get curly hair like that. And you will get well, the, olive tones and dark skin. But the skins. reason I'm laughing at your mom's case in particular is because your mom is super white and a redhead. Yes. She's not even like the Sephardic looking kind of Jew at right, all. Right, right, right. So she's like, nah, we not really, we not really white like that. <laughs> Look at you. You're like, that's my dad. Like, whatever. So, so walk it's real quick before we let you out of here. Lacey Schwartz, a little white lie in theaters. What, what locations are AMC, 42nd Street. Yes. Um, You leave Woodstock for the first time. Mm -hmm. And you uh, went through high school in Woodstock. So you're 18 years old. And you go where for college? Georgetown. <laughs> More oh, white. So you... Was that the mo were these the moments after 18 where you started to deal with your identity? Or yeah. had it started before college? So, I mean, when I went out... In my town when I grew up, nobody really said anything to me. I went to high school. The first time I was really around black kids, definitely segregated, but they would say things to me in the in the hallways. Like what? Like, what are you? And it was really obvious that they thought I was passing. Then when my parents split up at 16, I really started questioning the world, and I started dating a biracial dude who people would say to us when we walked down the street, you look like brother and sister. And he started really kind of getting in my ear and saying, come on. You gotta dig deeper. Like this He's doesn't like, you make sense. You gotta open your eyes. So by the time my parents had split up, and this guy was, you know, making me think, was when I applied to college, and they asked you to check a box. And I, at that point, it felt strange to identify as white any longer, but I didn't know what I was, so I didn't check any boxes. And they asked you to submit a photograph, so I just submitted a photograph. And Georgetown had admitted me as a black student. Based so, on your appearance. Wow. Based on how I looked. So I got wow. to college and was kind of classified as black and invited to the black student alliance meeting. And that's <laughs> you know all in the film. And that's how I kind of started exploring what it was to be black and came home after that experience at the end of my freshman year of college and asked my mom why she really thought I looked the way I did. Do you have any, um, in addition to the interviews and everything, <laughs> so good. do you have any home video stuff? Tons. Really? Tons. There's yeah. some in the film. There's the some trailer. in the film. Tons. That's what I mean in the film. I'm not going to go in her house and look through her own home videos. <laughs> yes, we have tons. Well, All right, that's crazy. awesome. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? A lot of home videos. You see a half black, half Jew, you get hyped. Shh, I do get hyped. <laughs> Yo, look, and Drake, I know you might not be watching this, but you should, sir. You got to get involved in this, my G. I know you know your heritage and everything, but. Some you know, black Jew stuff going on here. Yeah, some black Jew stuff happening. Let's talk about how good, like when that combination comes in, that level of curl that we're at, like how clean. <laughs> that hair, right? Woo! So answer me this, because some biracial people deal with this, right? Black people can be very harsh, very judgmental, very like, yo, you ain't black, you ain't black enough, da da da. Well, you're not white enough to be white or you're black like, enough to be black. Did you deal with this? Did you experience this? And you know, I didn't experience that, but I also like, you know, I have many privileges, and one of them was that, you know, I came into the black community at Georgetown, like an institution of higher learning, and so a lot of people I found in the black community there, you know, they were also kind of one of the few people of color in their mm. honors classes or whatever it was. So they were, I felt very embraced and I felt like the people at Georgetown in particular and then when I expanded from there, went on, um, they understood the full diversity of the Jew, uh, the Jewish, they understood the full diversity of the black community in a lot of ways much more than the Jewish community did. So I felt very embraced in that space. I know that there's other spaces and trust me, I'm seeing them on blogs now. What are they you saying know, on the blogs? You know, a lot of people are like, doesn't she have a mirror? Was she, you know, how kind of how stupid am I or right. were we and I think that that's why the film is so important because it really gets to it and explains it and a lot of people are in denial and a lot of people have this kind of stuff going on and we need to understand and move past it first of all I just want to say something right now for people who would say that if you knew the amount of women I've known over the history of my life who are one centimeter from looking exactly like you and we're just 100% Jewish. Yeah, yeah complexion-wise, yeah. exact same curls. Like, yeah, if I st if you were to tell me you're biracial, I could look at features and be like, oh, I could see how maybe one parent could be black. But if you've ever been to Israel or anywhere around the Mediterranean, you would see lots of people with her but I'm talking features, about, and, complexion. Uh, uh, totally, and I'm talking about also just regular Montgomery County, Maryland Jews where the girls have the same complexion and exact same curls. Yeah, yeah. It's not that much of a reach that if you didn't know otherwise... You would just think that's... But that's the ignorance of people. 
Why, why are they like that? Why are people like this? I don't know. Little White Lies, the film. Lacey Schwartz is her name. You put it together. Yo, this could turn into something for you. I bet it's Do already. Do not let Lifetime make a movie out of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what needs to happen for Please, you. Please, though. Ebro, is there one, one more last question? I want to ask. Sorry. N-word. Oh, does she use it or not? Do you say the word nigga? It's not really a word I use. Do I? Is the question, do I feel like I have the right to use it? Well, I know it? you feel like you have the right to use it. You, you identify as black. Yeah. It's not really a word that I use in common. Is you know what's words? interesting about the N-word is there is a world that exists where everyone thinks that all black people use the N-word or like to use the <laughs> N-word. And it's so not that. Like, I know more black people are like, I don't use that word like that. Now, they might be sitting around a domino table smoking a blunt with me and we might get, you know, start talking shit. But it's not, you know what I mean? It's just not used in casual conversation. Right, definitely. And you can always tell people who aren't really around black people or black people who actually think highly of themselves too frequently because they just listen to rap music or look at rap videos and think that that's how black people really act. You can always tell. The N-word is not commonly accepted in the black communities or even the black conversation like that. Well, not in a, certainly not an adult not for Definitely. adults, and definitely not for adults who, you know, have been to universities and college and hold themselves in a high regard. Yes, or adults who lived in an era in which the only use of that word was Derogatory. not friendly whatsoever. Right, 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 right. Mm. Well, thank you. For Sorry, that. yeah, I just thought that was an interesting. We always talk, the N-word comes up Lacey, quite a bit. did we not touch on anything you want to make sure we touch on? I think we're good. I think we're good. I'm really excited, you know, to talk about this film with this audience, and hopefully people can come out what and do you mean, the this conversation. What do you mean, audience? What are you talking about? <laughs> you talking about black people? <laughs> you talking about black people? Lacey, what's the official website? Anybody who wants to watch the trailer and get more info? Yeah, it's littlewhitelithefilm.com. Oh, sorry, one last thing. Damn, bro. Yo, I knew he would get excited around. I'm into it. I'm into it. Around a hot, half black, half Why? Black. I never said that. I haven't said anything about her hotness yeah, haven't yet. had to say anything. I can but see it. But when she it walks out, whole... we'll hear it. Okay, so what I was going to say that has nothing to do with that was your husband, the father of your children. Yeah. Black or what? He is black. Interesting. Not right. Jewish. But what I meant, I want to say about this audience is the fact that you guys, you know, have. No, don't somebody... clean it up. Don't clean it up. Really? No, <laughs> no we're just fucking with you anyway. Time. Nobody's <laughs> no, that. I'm not saying that at, at all. I just wanted to say that the fact that you all are talking about being black and Jewish on, uh, yes. like, number one hip hop radio yes, station yes, in New York yes. City and, you is know, really crucial. And I think the one thing that goes She's overlooked right. about Hot 97 is. Our listeners are the most diverse of any radio That's listener in the country. That's what I'm in saying. In the United States of America. Very true. True facts. I can't think of another kind of media outlet that's talking about being black and Jewish on a regular basis in a mainstream way. You know what? We actually win the title every year for most conversations related to blacks and Jews. Nice. Give it up for us. Big up for us. Big up for ourselves. Exactly. Do you give out that award? Uh, yes. I present <laughs> and accept. 